Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dia. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be doing another Kahoot and I'm going to be covering maternity and newborn medications. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it. So go ahead and press that like button now, thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX review sessions, part one and part two. It is not your traditional type of session, I'm telling you now. You can check that out by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. I'm also offering one-on-one -on -one private tutoring and consultation sessions that also you can reserve your spot by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. If you are a current nursing student, you haven't graduated yet, you haven't graduated yet, you're still in the program, but you're struggling. You have to do really well on your next exam. Be sure to check out the audio lessons I have available for you. I've made audio lessons specifically for students who are still in the nursing program and they are struggling. I have lots of subjects and content. Again, you can check that out by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics for free across my social media platforms. My handle is the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. So be sure to check me out here on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, or Facebook. All right, guys, without further ado, let's get started. Maternity and newborn medications. Before you give methylgonavine methogen to a patient, what should you assess for? Is it uterine tone? blood pressure, loci amount, or deep tendon reflexes. Before you give this medication, before you give methogen, what are you going to assess your patient for? Uterine tone, blood pressure, loci amount, or deep tendon reflexes? Blood pressure. So guys, this medication, it prevents um, postpartum bleeding. It causes contraction of the uterine muscles, but an adverse effect is going to be um, maybe hypertension, right? So before you administer this medication, you better take that patient's blood pressure because if that blood pressure is elevated, do you think it would be a good idea to give this medication? You're gonna notify the healthcare provider. Now, look at these other uh, choices, uterine tone, low key amount, deep tendon reflexes. These are assessments to make, but these are assessments you're gonna make after you've given the medication because you know the adverse effects of the medication. We're giving this medication um, to, um, to prevent postpartum bleeding, but you know that it affects that uterine muscle. So you're gonna check the tone, obviously, after you give the medication. Did the medication work? Didn't it work, right? You're gonna check the low-key amount because again, we want to prevent postpartum bleeding. So obviously you're gonna be checking for that. And of course, deep tendon reflexes because we know what it does to the muscles. But before you give that medication, you better check the blood pressure. And if it's elevated, you're gonna withhold it and call the healthcare provider, all right? Those of you who are on the live, if you weren't able to get in the classroom, just go ahead and type in your answers on the live. You can still participate. You plan to administer surfactant to a preemie in respiratory distress, okay? They have respiratory distress syndrome. How are you gonna give this medication? Is it gonna be given PO by mouth? Is it gonna be given intradermally? Is it gonna be given intramuscularly? Or is it gonna be given in, intra, I can't speak intratracheally, so intratracheal, intra, interdermal, by mouth, or I am. How are you going to give surfactant? Most of you guys chose I am. All right, guys, so I want you to think about this. Oh, I didn't put my... Okay, I want you guys to think about this. Um, we have a preemie, and the fact that we know it's a preemie, right? The fact that we know it's a preemie, one of the things that already should be going through your mind is surfactant. So we have a preemie, and they're on respir they have respiratory distress syndrome. Surfactant is what keeps the lungs from collapsing so the patient can breathe. We're giving surfactant to the patient, so you should be thinking about breathing, lungs, hello, in the tracheo. That's how you're going to give that medication. All right, guys. 
All right, type your answer. This medication stimulates smooth muscle contraction of the uterus. It promotes milk letdown. It induces labor. It controls bleeding. What is this medication? Type in your answer. We're talking about labor and delivery. It stimulates smooth muscle contractions of the uterus. It promotes milk letdown. It induces labor. It controls bleeding. What medication are we talking about? You can give me the generic or the brand. What's the medication? Very good. I see you guys answering correctly on the live. Oxytocin or Pitocin. Very good. Those are the two correct answers. You just gave magnesium sulfate to your patient. What would made you suspect toxicity? What would make you suspect magnesium toxicity? Would it be proteinuria of plus three, presence of deep tendon reflexes, a serum um, magnesium level of six, or respirations of 10 breaths per minute? What would make you suspect magnesium sulfate toxicity? Very good. Respirations of 10 breaths per minute. The minimum amount of respirations we should see in a minute is what? 12, right? So when it comes to magnesium sulfate, it's given to manage preeclampsia and um, some adverse effects that you can see because one of the things it does, it causes CN, it may cause CNS depression, right? So you may see a, a decrease in the maternal respirations, a decrease in the maternal um, heart rate, in the maternal blood pressure. You can see a decrease in the fetal heart rate. Those are signs and symptoms of a magnesium sulfate toxicity. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Protein you're plus three. Well, guess what? Think about it. We're giving magnesium sulfate to treat preeclampsia. Protein urea of plus three is a symptom of preeclampsia. So we expect to see that. So we're not going to suspect um, mag sulfate uh, toxicity in the protein urea of plus three. That's part of the disorder of preeclampsia. So that's not the answer. Presence of deep tendon reflexes. Well, we want to see presence of deep tendon reflexes. What we don't want to see is, um, you know, sluggish deep tendon reflexes, which magnesium, I'm sorry guys, which um, magnesium sulfate toxicity can cause, right? Serum magnesium level of six, that is um, normal. That falls within normal range. The normal range is four to 7.5. So we wouldn't suspect toxicity in that the only correct answer choice, guys, would be respirations, 10 breaths per minute. Remember, the least we want to see is 12, nothing lower than 12. Prostaglandin does what to the uterus? Type in your answer. What does prostaglandin do to the uterus? The correct answer is contraction. It contracts the uterus, okay? So when it comes to uh, prostaglandin, guys, it uh, stops postpartum hemorrhage. And you got to know the adverse effects of this medication, by the way. You know, nausea, vomiting, fever. In an adverse, not adverse, but contraindication, we are not going to give this medication. We're not going to give this medication to any patients that have asthma. Make sure you know that about this medication. What do these meds stop? So in the methicin, magnesium sulfate, nephetapine, terbutaline, richardine hydrochloride, all of these medications, what do they stop? Type in your answer.
endomethacine, magnesium sulfate, nifedipine, terbutaline, richardine hydrochloride. What do they stop? Wow. Okay. So guys, let's talk about this. Um, these medications stop preterm labor contractions. They stop contractions. If the per if the woman is preterm, we don't want her having that baby too early. It stops the preterm labor contractions. I'm seeing a lot of hypertension on the screen and also um, on the live. Let me clear this up, especially when it comes to magnesium sulfate because NCLEX loves to ask about this and I don't want you to get tricked. Yes, magnesium sulfate, a side effect of that medication is to bring down the blood pressure, but it's never an indication. There's a difference between indication and side effect or adverse reaction. Let me tell you something. There are so many drugs on the market that will bring down a patient's blood pressure without all the adverse effects that magnesium sulfate can cause. So we will never give magnesium sulfate as an indication to bring down the blood pressure. We have other things on the market. We're going to give magnesium sulfate along with, you know, endomethacin or terbutaline. We're going to give that to stop preterm labor. A side effect of max sulf is hypotension. It brings down the blood pressure, but it's not an indication. You will never give magnesium sulfate as an indication because we want to bring down the blood pressure. There's better stuff on the market. We're doing it to stop the preterm labor. And the side effect, if the patient happens to be, because usually, for example, if the patient's in preeclampsia, their blood pressure is going to be high. So a great thing that it also does is bring down the blood pressure, which will be happy about that. But that's not the reason why we're giving it. We're giving it to stop preterm labor. Make sure you guys know these medications that I just listed in the methicin, magnesium sulfate, nifedipine, terbutaline, richardine hydrochloride. They are given to stop preterm labor contractions. Okay. Make sure you know it. What symptom would make you stop administration of Pitocin or oxytocin? Why would you stop giving this medication? If you saw fatigue, if you saw your patient was drowsy, if you saw your patient had uterine hyperstimulation, or if your patient was experiencing early decelerations of fetal heart rate, which one would make you stop the administration of oxytocin Pitocin? Very good. Uterine hyperstimulation. I'm kind of upset that most of you guys chose early deceleration of fetal heart rate. Guys, early deceleration of fetal heart rate, that is a reassuring sign. That is good. We are happy about that. Let me tell you when we're worried. We're worried about late decelerations. That's when we get concerned. But early decelerations, I'm giving a thumbs up. We are very happy about that. So we're not going to stop giving Pitocin if we see early deceleration of fetal heart rate. That's a good thing. But if we see uterine hyperstimulation, absolutely. We're going to stop that medication. Why? Because what we don't want is uterine rupture. That's going to cause a medical emergency. So you see uterine hyperstimulation. That means the Pitocin is working a little bit too well. And we're going to have to stop um, administration of that med, okay? Now, the first two, fatigue and drowsiness, guys, the woman's going through labor. The act of labor itself, that process can cause the patient to have fatigue and drowsiness, right? That's not going to make a stop administration of oxytocin or pitocin, but uterine hyperstimulation, absolutely. That is an adverse effect. Which deep tendon reflex is considered normal or expected? One, two, three, or four. Which deep tendon reflex is considered to be normal or expected? Two. Two is normal. It's expected. It's considered to be active. When it's zero, guys, that means no response. That is bad. When it's one, that means there's a response, but it's sluggish. 
When it's two, that's normal. That's active. When it's three, it's slightly hyperactive. And when it's four, it's hyperactive. So your normal is going to be two. That's your expected, okay? Type in your answer. Beta-methasone is a corticosteroid that increases production of what? Beta-methasone. You guys are doing very good on the live. Type in your answer. Beta-methasone increases um, production of what? And this is a type of steroid you do need to have. Most of you guys got it correct, and the correct answer is surfactant. It's a cortical steroid that increases the production of surfactant, guys. So now um, we um, use this in preterm patients that's between about 28 to 32 um, weeks gestation. You're going to make sure that you check the patient's vital signs. You're going to make sure that you check their lung sounds. You're going to make sure that you're monitoring for signs and symptoms of infection. Um, why? I just told you it's a... a Cortical steroid. What do we know about cortical steroids? They increase the glucose, right? So it can cause hyperglycemia. It masks the signs and symptoms of infection. So you're going to watch your patient much more closely for infection. You're going to be looking at the WBCs. You're going to be checking the temperature. You're going to be watching for signs and symptoms of infection. And the third thing that um, cortical steroids can do, they can cause um, osteoporosis if given long term. Now, obviously, this type of patient, they're not going to be getting this long term. But for other types of patients who are taking cortical steroids, you're going to be watching out for um, osteoporosis. And actually, there's a fourth thing that cortical steroids do. They're very hard on the stomach. They can cause gastric ulcers. Um, but anyway, for this type of patient, you're going to be making sure they don't have a fever. You're going to be watching out for signs and symptoms of infection. You're going to be listening to the lung sounds because you know what it does. Um, it helps... Um, with the production of surfactant. So you want to be um, checking those lung sounds, monitoring WBCs, et cetera. That's right, immunosuppressive agent. Last question. Your patient just received epidural anesthesia for pain. What would you have readily available at the bedside? Would it be morphine sulfate? Would it be naloxone? Would it be beta-methasone? Or would it be meperidine hydrochloride? That's your Demerol. Your patient just had an ep epidural anesthesia for pain. What would you make sure would be right there at the bedside? Very good. Naloxone, guys, that's an opioid um, antagonist. Think about it. Your patient just had an epidural anesthesia for pain and epidural anesthesia. Those are what? Narcotics are used, right? So it's not going to be morphine sulfate. That's a narcotic. It's not going to be meperidine hydrochloride, the Demerol. That's a narcotic. So we're getting rid of those choices. And beta 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 methasone, we just talked about that. You know it's a cortical steroid. It's used to increase lung maturity. So what we're going to give is going to be naloxone. Again, guys, that's going to be your opioid antagonist because um, if those narcotics work a little bit too well, right, we might need something to reverse it and it's going to be can. And that is it, guys. Let's see how well you did.